know that your genes give you your traits. But what if I told you that's not the only aspect of your genetic code that makes you who you are? Hi, my name is Shelby, and I'm working under Lourdes Velasquez and Dr. Deborah Feigenson's lab, who use DNA nanotechnology to learn more about the structure of DNA. So, you're probably familiar with the coding aspect of DNA, or how the different base pairs code for your genes and give you your traits. But there are also non-coding aspects of DNA that contribute to gene expression. The structure of DNA and the way it is stored also helps determine which of your genes are expressed and which are silent. This is why two twins can have identical genomes, but very different appearances or health conditions based upon which genes are selectively expressed or stored. In order for a trait to be expressed, DNA has to unwind and bend in the presence of enzymes in order for the genetic code to be transcribed. Now, we already have an understanding of the average bending of DNA, but we know less about how it moves dynamically. So, how the angle fluctuates over time or changes in the presence of stimuli, such as an enzyme. By studying the bend dynamics of DNA, we can gain a better understanding of how your genome is impacted by the storage and retrieval of genetic information. So, how can we measure bend dynamics? Well, with origami, but not paper origami, DNA origami, a process that allows us to fold DNA into a two or three dimensional shape. We can use DNA origami to build a tool that allows us to measure the bend dynamics by labeling it fluorescently so we can view it under the microscope. And we call this tool a nunchuck. Then this is what it looks like under an atomic force microscope. Now, the nunchuck consists of two DNA origami seeds labeled red and connected by a piece of double-stranded DNA. The seeds have adapter strands on them which allow for DNA tiles to nucleate off of and form the nanotubes. Now, each of the seeds has different adapter strands, and this ensures that we're able to label one of the seeds green, but the other one blue and green. That way, we can see both of the arms underneath the microscope with a green filter, but one will be half as bright, so we can differentiate them. But under a blue filter, we can only see one of the arms, and this is a good way to check that we've actually built a nunchuck. Now, underneath the microscope, you can't see the slinker strand of DNA, but by focusing on the movement of the arms, we can interpret the way the strand, the strand is bending and gain a better idea of these bend dynamics. But the problem with our nunchucks is that they're difficult to build, and DNA origami gives us very inconsistent seed yields. These inconsistencies increase the amount of time we spend designing them. We want to be able to quantify the concentration of seeds in order to streamline this process. And to do this, we're going to measure the concentration of double-stranded DNA in our seeds and calibrate it to our final nunchuck yield. That way, we can go from a reading of double-stranded DNA and know how many seeds to add in order to achieve the best yield of nunchucks. So how exactly do we make our nunchucks? Well, we start with a ring of single-stranded M13 DNA from a bacteriophage. And next, we add our staple strands. And these are pieces of single-stranded DNA that allow us to fold the M13 DNA into our seed shape. And we also add linker strands. And we have two corresponding linker strands, and half of the seeds get one type and half the other. And then we anneal our seeds, or heat them up so they fold into the shape. And you'll notice um, not all of the M13 DNA is actually folded into the seed shape. There's actually an excess cloud hanging off. And so after that, we will mix the two separate seeds, and the linkers will connect and dimerize, and we have our seeds. So the next step is to purify our seeds, and to do this, we use gel, gel electrophoresis. And so what this is, is we put our seeds into an agarose gel and run an electric current through it. And now DNA is negatively charged, so it'll flow towards the positive end. 
but the smaller pieces will go faster through the pores of the gel, while the larger pieces will get stuck and move slower. And this is a good way for us to filter out any excess staple strands or seeds that didn't dimerize. So now we have our purified seeds, but we have no idea how concentrated they are. So this is where the cubit comes in. The cubit fluorometer allows us to measure the concentration of double-stranded DNA in our sample by attaching fluorescent dyes to the double-stranded DNA. So now we know how much double-stranded DNA is in our sample. And it's time to make our nunchucks. So we start with our tiles, and the single-stranded pieces of DNA line up in the configuration like this. And this makes exactly one tile. And now we label our tiles either with two green fluorophores or a green and a blue fluorophore. And you'll remember that one of the arms is either all green or green and blue. And so then we'll add our tiles to our test tube, our tile strands to our test tubes, and heat them up to form a tile. And our next step is to add our seeds. But because we don't know how concentrated they are, we have to add them in different amounts. And so once we add our seeds, the tiles nucleate off and form our nunchucks. And our next step is to visualize them under the microscope. But we have to visualize each of these conditions. And as you can see, our current sweep procedure is inefficient because we have to take the time to look at each of these conditions and determine, and determine which one gave us the best yield. And it's also wasteful because not all of these will give us optimal nunchucks. So we made two separate batches of seeds, one of which had a higher concentration of double-stranded DNA and one of which had a lower concentration. And we analyzed both of them for nunchuck yields. And to do this, we, look, we use a computer program to count up the number of seeds, which you can see as small red dots. And then manually, we count up the number of nunchucks, which are circled in yellow. And you can see they have a red seed in the center, a green arm, and a blue arm. And so the percent of seeds that form nunchucks is what our nunchuck yield is. And so these are about four samples at one microliter of seeds added. And as you can see, we have a much better yield for the high amount of double-stranded DNA. And for the low amount of double-stranded DNA, we have a much worse yield. Now, these are the same two batches of seeds, but this time at three microliters added. And as you can see, now the higher amount of double-stranded DNA has given us a much worse yield while the lower amount of double-stranded DNA has given us a much higher yield of nunchucks. And so what we were able to determine is that if you have a lower cubit beating, you should be adding more seeds in order to boost your yield of nunchucks. However, if you have a much higher cubit beating, you should be adding less seeds. And that way, you'll be able to preserve your arm length. Because if you have too many seeds but the same amount of tiles, your arms will be much too short to see and visualize. So now that we've calibrated this cubit reading of double-stranded DNA to the amount of seeds to add, we don't need this sweet procedure anymore, and it'll be much easier for us to jump to taking dynamic images or movies, like this one you can see here. And you can even see how the nunchuck is bending over time. And so our next steps going forward would be to start taking these dynamic images under different conditions and getting a better idea of how bend dynamics impact the genome. And so I'd just like to take a minute to thank my PI, Deborah, and my mentor, Lourdes, along with some other members of our lab, uh, Chandra and Amber, and also especially Sebastian, who lent me some of the images you saw in this presentation today and also CSEP for funding my summer here. Thank you.